I, uh, thank you very much, Pumina. Thank you very much, Dixa. This was wonderful. Two really great uh, contributions, I think. It's, it's a little bit hard for me to put them together and to just connect. So um, I think there is something. I think there's something about, and actually something that you asked in the panel before about the politics of uh, utilities. And I think in both cases, uh, they are somewhat there. Um, I mean, I think the idea of, uh, you know, of, of the vago, right? Of, of this, uh, el negro vago, it's, it's, it's referring particularly about labor and that. And, and, and then your sense of utility with, with textiles and, um, and labor. I think there's, there's something that we could draw there that could bring us um, the, the two panels, I mean, the two talks together. But I think uh, perhaps I'll just open up uh, to questions uh, and then we can come back. Um, this question is for Dixa, and it actually goes back to the last panel, <laughs> in the way in which you actually, you, when you said, you know, the, the resonances between the two panels. Um, and I was super struck by um, the relationship between movement and motion in indolence, and the extent to which, because there, there was a, a certain moment when you said it looks like stasis, like some of the things look like stasis. And I would agree, but I, I felt like going back to the question of intentionality, that the reading of the black body as in motion, right, and useless, right, that, 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 that there was a uselessness that was so sexualized and seductive, right, versus movement, which is what is assumed to be productive, right? And I just wanted to hear, because I've, I hadn't thought about the, the concept of indolence, and I was really struck by it, the way in which you were presenting it, like, through a prism <laughs> that let me see so many things. So I just, I wanted to sort of bring out the subtlety of your argument in saying, you know, what, we're, what these descriptions are of may seem like, or what we're looking at may seem like stasis, but there's actually a really um, productive tension between motion and movement that is being um, both sexualized and primitivized. So we'll take two more and then. Hi, thanks both for both of those, those really great presentations. I have a question for Dixa. Um, which is, so I think as I was hearing the sort of earlier, the earlier expressions or the earlier readings of black indolence, uh, particularly in the Comergente and the Negro Incognito and the Negro Republic were producing horror. While as with Benitez Rojos, you're seeing something quite different, uh, which is this sort of co very complicated reading of reassurance. And I, I think you said this. So um, one of the things I wanted to ask you was um, how this question of, uh, I mean, I, I, I've read that Benitez Rojo passage and been kind of <laughs> very troubled by it a lot of times. Um, so I'm thinking, you know, one thing that it seems that Benitez Rojo is doing in his passage, in that passage, is seeing a connection between indolence and prescience, um, and indolence and a sort of intervening in the inevitable. Because the, basically the scene is, you know, we all think the Cuban Missile Crisis is going to blow up the country. I see these two women and the way they move reassures me that they're not. Um, and in fact, you know, and in fact, it doesn't happen, right? Um, so I wondered if there's a, if there's a similar connection in the uh, is a similar connection between prescience um, and intervening in the inevitable, which could be intervening in the historically inevitable, uh, in the places where you see this as expressions of horror rather than reassurance. If that makes sense. It's not sure. Hi, um, thank you both for these really amazing talks. Um, my question is actually also for Dixa. Um, I'm thinking about specifically the site of the High Line in Ligia's uh, performance. Um, and I'm interested in connecting it to two things. I think first, I'm interested in your conception of the hills and I'm wondering how the hills appears actually in the urban landscape. Um, in the urban landscape, how the hills appears there. Um, specifically because the High Line, a couple of years ago only, um, was a kind of concrete wasteland to use Professor Con Perry's language. 
um, that was then kind of made into a public park in a system of gentrification in the meatpacking district. Um, and so I'm interested in how the hills appear there and how, as you're reading the hills and Lehia's performance, it also kind of excavates the, the urban history of that site. Um, and going along with that thread, I'm interested then in like the meatpacking district and what it made me, what it reminded me of as a kind of like concrete waste was also its kind of uh, notoriety in a history of New York City as a site for sex work and especially trans sex work. Um, and so I'm wondering about also the relationship between indolence and a kind of lack of manual labor, but then also the performance of sexual labor within that. Um, thinking about the first poem you showed and the kind of figure of the street walker um, and what that has to do for your conception of the relationship specifically between indolence and the appearance of the hills. Uh, thank you so much for these uh, really interesting questions and I hope I, is this on? Um, and I really hope I can get to them. First, I would like to admit this is stuff that's really early, right? I'm starting this new chapter that actually is mostly readings of films. Films like I Walked With a Zombie, <laughs> a 1943 film that allowed me to, so I'm, I used this opportunity to think through indolence precisely as a uh, portal, as I like to call it, a portal into thinking about how blackness as it has been kind of invented through the Americas, um, has dealt with the tensions between labor resistance and stasis. Um, so to return to Tina's question, this question of what looks like stasis, I'm trying to, there's a lot of tension between what I'm seeing as stasis and motion and movement, right? Um, I think that to me what was striking about some of these examples is the extent to which so much of it has to do with what looks like something but is actually something else. And I was inspired to think of it that way through Ligia Lewis's performance actually, which is basically, I think I gave you a glimpse of them. Each dancer has to stand there as if they were still, they were still but they were not, they were shaking with incredible effort and energy was kind of building up, right? And I was inspired then to think through how Lee has exploring these um, questions of what it means to be a still black body, right? Um, in relation to these examples of black indolence that I found in the archive and terror, the terror of black indolence. So in a way, the way I'm thinking about this is why is it that black indolence becomes the site of horror for these colonial authorities, if indeed it is simply a matter of blacks being still and doing nothing. Like clearly there's a kind of pulsation and an energy that is evident in that fear. Yeah? Why is that not stasis? I'm that's not. What I, that's what I define as stasis. Because right. it is that, it is all of those forces, right? It is not stillness, it is, it is about the, the sort of the vibration mm -hmm. that comes from, you know, the, the sort of damming up of so much force. Mm -hmm. And that that performance is like, to me, I was, I was like, that is the most, the most beautiful embodiment of it. Mm -hmm. I mean, the other thing I had, the other question I had was, you know, because what they're balancing is something between stasis and that equilibrium of forces and slowness. Right, mm -hmm. and that that that's another sort of tension that I think is super productive in what you're mm -hmm. saying. Mm -hmm. But you know, yeah. But I'm sorry, I'm, I'm so excited. <laughs> <laughs> no, and thank you for this because indeed there are nuances there for me to tease out between stillness and stasis, movement, motion, etc. That I've yet to do, mm -hmm. right? And this is very much a new. This is a meta commentary on how the process of writing. <laughs> Um, how I'm coming into the language of dance and choreography after having written one of my chapters on photography and also having to learn that language of photography. Um, and so, but what was fascinating to me is how I'm finding these examples of whether stasis or stillness, 
movement or motion or all of the above or some combination of the above in these archives that seem to have nothing to do with these movements and how completely, I'm just fascinated by the push and pull, and this is actually going to get to um, Esther's question, uh, between both the fear of the colonial authority in the face of what might be a pulsing fugitivity that seems to be still, but that has an energy that seems to be, that's building up and about to explode, and the colonial authority kind of sensing that. So the fear of that, but also the desire to render it safe somehow to render it safe, whether by sexualizing it or ethnographizing it, or um, even I think in some ways rendering it safe by kind of camouflaging it in the language of horror itself, because it makes sense. Um, and then, so that on one side, and also handling how different black actors in my, arch in my really long <laughs> archive, um, are breaking through these attempts to capture, right? And in this chapter that I presented you a little bit of, it's thinking through how some of these black figures are breaking through the attempts at capture through a breaking of expectations of rhythm. Um, and so, so Benitez Rojo to me is I'm just fascinated by how he immediately translate this movement to comfort. Um, and I also, I cite Benitez Rojo in great part because he's very influential, but also as a, I metonymize him actually in a way because he's very exemplary of a really pervasive way of reading black women's movements and bodies in the Spanish Caribbean um, and in literature writ large. I'm not sure if I remember if there was another valence to your question? Just that it, it seems that he had worked with students reading them quickly and he told us it's time to make them. Hey, Tom, we don't hear you. So, yeah, the other, the other part of the question was, uh, you know, it seems that he's reading them as having, this movement as having some sort of power to arrest right. history. Um, and, you know, whether that's something you could also read in the, in, the, in, the, in the different context that you talked about. Yeah, no, thank you for the clarification. Yeah, I am just so fascinated by the simultaneous, the attempts to render safe, but also giving kind of power. But nonetheless, it is, it is very much an outsider gaze. This is why I'm so interested in how Gloria Stefan then sort of, in one way, on the one hand, repeats some of these ideas of rhythm, black rhythm as both horrific and, and as something you desire, but not at a distance. She literally is thinking through them being incorporate or possessing um, the previous gazer at a distance. But nevertheless, the expectation of black rhythm as a very specific thing remains. Um, and then finally, to get to Sebastian's question, the, um, the High Line is definitely not a hill space or a black outdoors. <laughs> and, and actually, to give a very short answer to the question, because I definitely uh, don't want to ramble on, um, I think that the way I'm thinking about the hills throughout my book as an idea, and not only as a space, is precisely in how it, it is a site of disturbance in space-time fabric. <laughs> Right, and the expectation of rhythm and the kind of the way the hills, whether that be in the figure of the black indolent person or in the figure of a, a rhythmic recoil, so to speak, is able to kind of break from e epistemic ideas of what how time moves and how space is supposed to be used. Right, and so I see Leah Lewis as also doing enacting that in that performance and her dancers, obviously, and her brother and his soundscape as erupting in that specific urban space of the hills. Um, and unfortunately, I don't know much about the, the broader context of the meatpacking, but I would say, I would just suggest that I'm looking at it in the same way of how these kinds of performances, and she's specifically interested in kind of showing black dance, uh, even though not all the dancers are black, but I think she places herself in this tradition of modern choreography. Um, how black dance has the power to sort of be a site of disturbance in different spaces and in different time periods. And I'll leave it.
Yeah, I would like to ask something. Uh, I would like to start maybe with Colombi with the, uh, your lecture. If you can say more, you uh, you spoke about the self touch and autonomy, and I'm thinking in the context of you know the post colony that you are speaking in. Uh, if you can say something about the possible connection between the way that for Gandhi the term self-determination or the practice or the idea of self-determination was related to that. And in a different way, I would like to ask uh, you, Dixa, first, sorry, really, I enjoyed enormously both presentations. So I would, wanted to start by that, but I already jumped into the question. So uh, Dix, I wanted to ask you, and I think that this is related maybe to something that we have already started to touch upon this morning, how much imperial temporality is corrupted and actually all this uh, engagement with repair or reparation or retouch, or it's, it's an attempt to, to make sense of another temporality. And this brings me to the question that I wanted to ask you, Dixa. Uh, uh, you spoke a lot about the hills uh, uh, as a place of escape, as a place of unruliness. And it is as if this is only in response to the attempt to discipline the body and to uh, master the body. But uh, maybe what makes it so disturbing uh, the hill, uh, is that this is maybe also a place of origin, which is a pre-imperial place. So, uh, so in this sense, my question to both of you is to ask you about the temporality that uh, uh, undermine, that you undermine with the, this other temporality, the way that all these concepts are being occupied to come back again to the morning session, occupied by imperial power to begin with, and then you are engaging with them to uh, loosen their temporality in order to make something else. But I really think that the hills, it's not only because they cannot master it now. It is because, you know, uh, uh, Western settler imperialism, settler colonialism is obsessed by the myth of origins. All the notion of, you know, the, uh, 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 the social contract is the beginning and then we domesticated it. But this beginning is completely different than what is implied in your presentation. This origins one. I'll take one more. Um, I have two very separate questions. Um, for Palomi, I was wondering, um, when I was listening to you speak, I was thinking about whether or not you were thinking about the way you were thinking about contingency as sort of this way out of having to engage with the violence of development, development discourse, and sort of NGOization. I don't know if that's a word, but let's just call it that, <laughs> right? Um, in terms of, of feminized labor. And so I was wondering if I could hear a bit more about that. And then, Dixa, when you were talking, the minute you started talking, even before you got to that moment in the definition, I was thinking about encomienda. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the, the history of encomienda in terms of um, indentured indigenous labor and tribute. So I was wondering how that was going to work into your argument. Mm -hmm. uh, one more over there. Um, this, I ha also had a question for Palomi, and I think it's related to both Ariela's and Patty's, but um, uh, I'm interested in you, you started by saying that these acts of touch refused teleological, progressive teleological, and yet I'm, I'm struggling by the, I'm struggling with how you're thinking about uh, labor and, for example, the incorporation of a feminized labor into an economy, which to me s seems like the epitome of of development, right, right, of teleological progress within capitalism, and and that tension between touch that maybe escapes it, but it's only always in relationship to to that uh, uh, progress that it, we might call development. And this is also related to the idea of, in a broader sense, of the post-colonial nation and what we might think. I'm thinking here with uh, subaltern studies scholars, you know, who really laid the groundwork for saying how the the post-colonial nation is a product of of the instantiation of the Western state and all these institutions, right? So that 
even while even all these nationalist movements are continuing a kind of imperial project while arguing against it, right? And so that, that tension that you're the between like how do we make sense of 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 development in these moments of touch that uh, may allow us to think about another wise. And I'm, I'm, I, I want to hear more about your thoughts on that. No, we'll make it. Um, thank you for those questions. Uh, and I actually think maybe your question offers me a way into both Ariella and Patricia's, uh, which is that fundamentally Gandhi is a liberal. Mm -hmm. That's what he is. And so he has, in this political project, he has some at least purported faith in this idea of the autonomous self. Um, and what I'm struck by in part of my attempt to reread Gandhi's labor is that, one, we know that that's an utter fiction. It's a fiction for Gandhi, but it's also a fiction for the vast majority of people who, one, failed at the Gandhian project, even as the Gandhian project itself failed. So um, that, in fact, we can go back to this moment of apparent failure, the Kadi um, Satyagrahan moment, um, and see there that actually something else would have been possible. The vision of a different kind of post-colonial collectivity that didn't map on to the nation state necessarily, that didn't map take the sovereign subject as its actor. Um, and it's, you know, it's an eruptive possibility that with the actual emergence of political modernity in India, for which it was celebrated until I would say probably this past year, we were happy to call India the kind of like er post-colonial modern state, um, that all of those inherited tropes of empire actually won out over this other potentially more radical vision. Um, and you see that again then in the case of Bangladesh where the questions of modernity now are less about uh, the post-colonial nation state and more about the way in which it is a laboratory for development indices. Um, and there too, uh, what you see in women's labor, both, um, I, I have a chapter on NGOs and handicraft um, and also on garments work, is that here too, even as they are the metrics of national development um, and development possibility and economic possibility, these women see their own relationship to each other, to the objects of their manufacture, in totally different ways. Um, and it is when we can return to a language of intentionality and desire, which you know, artistic fabrics give us, um, and give it to the, the mundane commodity that I think we begin to see the possibility of forms of um, demands for uh, kinds of recognition of life, um, communitarian projects that exist um, and simply don't take up the language of like, that we think of as the political. So, you know, trying to think about both, uh, just as we can think about the Gandhian project as both aesthetic and political, what would happen if we thought about contemporary garments work as both aesthetic and political, and not just a site of failure, a failure of recognizing one's own desires, a failure of, uh, of safety, you know, even though this is progressive teleology in some ways, um, all of the readings in like the popular press around the garment factory accidents and incidents was of um, a reference to the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory. So in 2013, Bangladesh is like America was in, 20, in 1911, except that that repetition, that kind of uncanny stutter, um, isn't just a site of Bangladesh's failing to inhabit technological modernity. I think something else is possible. What would happen if um, these two these two ahistorical things were made contemporary. I think something else emerges. So there is a way in which um, post-colonial belatedness might help us to, to trouble this fantasy of progressive historicism. Uh, I actually think my answer will address these two because to me they're these two questions that you asked. Um, and that, in part, I'll answer it by saying that from the very beginning, um, insurrection first performed by indigenous people fleeing the encomienda um, was very soon joined in this space of the Caribbean, especially the island of what is now Haiti and the DR, 
by uh, insurrecting blacks running into the mountains to join already pre-existing indigenous community. And so when I think of the hills um, as instantiating an alternative kind of modernity, post-1492 modernity in the Americas, there is, it, is, it becomes completely impossible to separate blackness from indigeneity, which definitely also creates, um, I wouldn't say problem, but a kind of tension maybe with how blackness and indigeneity is discussed in the US, where in this Caribbean space, whatever has become associated with indigeneity and blackness were kind of enfolded within each other and through each other from the outset, and especially in the space of either escape into the hills, El Monte, or as an idea, as the centuries kind of wore on, El Monte emerges in a lot of Spanish Caribbean literature and in Anglophone and Francophone literature, Le Mans, La Monte, um, the hills, right, as a space separate from whatever modernity has come to mean, but also as an alternative modernity, and this addresses your question, um, Ariella, that it, this question of origin is really fascinating because, of course, what was enacted in these so-called hill spaces, which actually could also be swamps or <laughs> marshes, right? If we think about Florida and how important also that becomes, maroonish becomes there, um, as a space of dif ge difficult geography, non-productive geography, that whatever happened in those spaces may be, or definitely had to do with different indigenous groups and African groups sort of practices before colonialism, but that in their enfolding with each other and dealing with the violence that they're fleeing, that new things were created. So the idea of origin becomes really difficult or complicated by the fact that this space before is, I like to think of it more as a space, a space alongside and in refutation of, rather than maybe a before, right? It's a sort of like, a, a, um, a besideness, I think, would be another way of putting it, that is often in opposition to and sometimes kind of separate from, right? But that I'm, what I'm interested in my work, at least for this book, is thinking about how the hills emerge also in an, imagine, in an imaginary, right? To disrupt time and space, not only remaining set off from the side, but to me, I really emphatically think of what I'm calling the hills, but we could call other things, as very much an alternative modernity, if we think of modernity as unfolded through colonialism post-1482. Any other question? Oh, uh, you have a question over there. Yeah. Um, thanks a lot. Um, just, I want to ask about a um, concept that I've been, uh, has been occurring to me throughout the last few papers, and, and it's constraint. And it, seem, it seems to me that, that uh, both, um, well, uh, Jasmine's um, paper also, choreography is in a sense a, a, form, of con uh, a form of constraint. Um, um, dances, I mean, the, a black dance is, is constrained into, uh, you know, it's not a, um, it's, not, it's, it's a, uh, um, it's a kind of forced response in a particular kind of situation. And it seemed to me that both of the papers that we just heard are also, um, there's a kind of sense of constraint as operating behind both the concept of, um, of, um, uh, um, of indolence uh, and also the, the, um, the uh, concept of contingency. And I wondered whether you both might say something about the, the sort of paired um, concepts of constraint and agency. Um, how they play out in both of your papers. Does that make sense as a question? Yeah. Thank you. I have a question. Um, it might be rather basic, but I'm, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about like the specter of Africa as maybe being an original source of indolence, but then also the, 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 the source of rhythm. Um, it seemed to me to be trading on some pretty obvious tropes um, in terms of the masks and the kinds of movements, um, the, fa the fa like just stereotypical markings of Africanness. So I guess I'm wondering how Africa might be showing up. I'm also thinking about one of the images of the man from Guinea. Uh, so 
if that's showing up at all in your project, and uh, part of what's coming to my mind now is Barbara Browning's infectious rhythm, um, thinking about um, uh, Africanist, Afro-diasporic dance as, as both titillating but also instilling fear um, and contagious uh, in ways that are, um, uh, for, for her, difficult to control. So just wondering if that shows up at all. Is there one other question? Uh, perhaps if you want to go ahead and talk about constraints first. Yes, no problem. <laughs> uh, yeah, the question about constraint is, is a really important one, I think, because part of one of the things that so much work on contingency does is um, romanticize possibility, and I think that part of my attempt to think through contingency in these moments of failure is not to suggest um, excess, right? I think that I'd, I'd like to draw a type, like a, a, dis a distinction between something like effervescence um, and excess, because I think that what is seemingly lost or seemingly disappeared um, is important because it is harder to constrain. Um, excess can be constrained constrained, it can be the site of constraint. I think that the sort of effervescent or this um, eruptive model is much more difficult. And so um, that does mean, though, that it, it's much easier to diagnose failure too, right? Um, that in these moments, it's much easier to, to take that last image um, and diagnose it as a site of failure. And so, um, you know, I think that this is part of what I'm trying to push against. Like, how else do we read um, these moments together and think about contingency with I, without either um, romanticizing that which is fugitive or um, recognizing only the limits of what is constrained. Um, thank you for these questions. So in terms of constraint, I think if I were to um, brainstorm about what I was um, thinking through for this project and especially what I shared with you today. I would say in many ways what I'm interested in is exploring how the archives I'm exploring, especially by those who are writing from a perspective of, um, of authority, how they, I'm trying to think of how they're constrained by what is legible to them in what they see um, and trying to move beyond this constraint by thinking about different grammars and, um, and aesthetics of, in this case, black indolence, right? So in many ways, some of the examples I brought out uh, were meant to showcase how some of these figures were constrained by their own kind of Western epistemic framework and an inability to see black indolence in a prismatic way that I'm trying to understand because of course I'm coming from a perspective, right, that is constrained by Western education and context, et cetera, et cetera, right? And a lot of it remains illegible. Um, and I think this segues well into my trying to answer Jasmine's question about how Africa comes in because there's a way in which someone like Pales Matos uh, in dealing with the blackness around him in the context of Puerto Rico and the Caribbean, in his poetry in general, his examples of blackness are always an idea of Africa and never an idea of blackness around him, uh, which is really fascinating. And so to me, blackness emerges in a very, in a similar way in his poetry um, as akin to maybe the way some people have written about in, how indigenous people emerge in the US, Canada context as an inability to move through time, right? And for him and for many other people who I'm thinking about who are canonical in the Caribbean and in the extended Caribbean, there's a kind of constraint that ties blackness to an unmoving, un, unchanging, atemporal, frozen in time, primitive Africa. And this is not, on the other hand, I want to be careful not to sort of denigrate whatever that might mean. <laughs> what, or what I should say is whatever African, quote unquote, which is like African rhythm doesn't really have a meaning. There are so many rhythms, obviously. Um, 
but that there is a way in which blackness for some of these figures and the hills more broadly speaking and black rebellion become a constrained by an imaginary that cannot imagine blackness as moving through time and especially moving through a different time than Western time or ideas of universal Western time. Um, there's something very safe about thinking about black insurrections as something that is always already primitive African because that's something that can, in a white European imaginary, be subsumed in some way, right? There's something a lot more threatening about black and blackness, black indigeneity as moving in an alternative way and in opposition to these other logics of time and the attendant connection to labor. Um, I mean, and many people have written about how blackness moves through time through labor, right? You become a modern black subject through labor. This emerges quite a lot. And so it's interesting how these Caribbean authors um, freeze blackness by thinking about blackness as always already an African thing rather than something that maybe has shifted through colonialism. I have uh, two questions to close, but I would allow other people if they have questions. Um, we have 10 more minutes. Well, if not, I'm just gonna, one question for each. I think it's just going back to the idea of temporality because I was still thinking about Ariel's question. And there is this other sense, the, uh, perhaps you haven't spoke directly, but it's this idea of, uh, you know, there, if there's other kinds of temporalities. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a, a little bit of discourse around that in relation to indigenous people, right? And, um, and, and this idea of, uh, I, for me, the whole, what you're bringing into blackness is very interesting. There's, in Spanish, it's always been the el indio vago, right? right. <laughs> so it's the lazy indigenous, and that's, that's the discourse that's been carried out uh, for centuries, right? And so, I, and, and it's perhaps, and there's some people talking about it, it's perhaps the, and there's a different sense of temporality, and it's just, that's the difference, you know? Mm -hmm. And so perhaps if you can elaborate it in that sense, you know, uh, if you see some relationship with that, that sense of laziness and temporality, mm -hmm. if there's some something that you can think about that, and um, and and for you, uh, Pauline, I, I was just thinking a lot about the your idea of touch, and you know, touch has this sense of intentionality, but it also has this. Um, it's one of those senses that we cannot avoid, right? You, it's. There's a lot of uh, not intentionality happening with touch. So I was wondering if you could think about this touch that happens once these textiles that have been produced over there come here, and the sense of touching that materiality that's being produced. So we touching this material, and then there's that sense of another sense of touch that happens you know, now in, in the Western world, let's say. <laughs> Thank you for this question. You know, as, you're, as we are taught, you and Ariel especially, are making me think more about temporality. I'm really inspired by, I think, Nicole Guido de Hernandez and Josie Saldana um, writing about heterotemporality. Um, and the idea that there are different, and of, of course, Bakhtin has another word for it that I'm not forgetting, but the kind of overlaying the comp very complicated over layering of different ways of occupying space in time and how, right, I keep talking about Western time, but Western time doesn't exist only, at, only right? And so the hills are always kind of occupying these other temporalities, especially more dominant ones. Um, and in terms of laziness, I just wrote here as you were talking, what looks like laziness among indigenous and black people, uh, especially f in the face of colonial authority, is quite often a, a misunderstanding of what, how people labor or move through time differently. And just to give you an example, um, a non-black indigenous exam example, um, the very concept that when British settlers appeared um, on what is now the US, they often misunderstood agricultural practices so that the land is called wasteland to lock, right? 
because he cannot see and perceive, he's unable to make legible how indigenous people and different groups of indigenous people used the land to give it, give them fruit, right? It's, and it's, it's also very gendered because for instance, he's unable to understand that it is the women who, in some of these indigenous groups in the Northeast especially, who are responsible for working the land and to him men working the land is what made it property. Um, and so again, to him it was like they don't labor, they're just, this land is just sitting there <laughs> doing nothing. Um, wherein in fact, and, and I also don't want, in saying all of this, I don't want to make it seem like labor is the uh, only way no matter what kind of labor it is. Nevertheless, he is unable to see that there had been an intentional, to go back to this, working of the land. And it looks like the land was just lying there doing nothing, right? And being wasteland. So it's, to me, it's about eligibility. Yeah, just being unable to read what is happening. Thank you for your question. I, I think one way to think about the question of time and intentionality um, is the to think about like the new kind of um, protests against what's getting called fast fast fashion, mm -hmm. which is what contemporary like ready-made garments are supposed to be, um, and this idea that one we shouldn't be buying these things because they produce these terrible structures, but somewhere also this idea that this happens in a time and place outside of normal time and place. Like that's what the factory is. Um, and there's something about the closeness of the factory and the time of factory labor, uh, which promises on the one hand that what comes outside is has to be shorn from what happened inside, right? So even if you're wearing um, this fabric, and you know, I, I spent time in these factories and I like learned how to use the machines. Um, and I have to say, it's like the most exertive work I've ever done in my life. Um, and any fantasy we have that that is not handmade um, falls apart when you realize how much, of, like forget the hand, the body, you know, sweat, blood, um, spit um, goes into the making it. And, you know, there's a sense that like if you knew, much like say meat, if you knew how it was made, you wouldn't, you wouldn't buy it. But I think that that's the, the slightly the wrong question. The question is like, what would happen if we move the factory into the open space of say, forget Gandhi's vision, but like um, the fair trade handicrafts that you can buy at 10,000 villages and which always have like an image of, you know, usually a woman working um, making this thing. Cause that's the form of labor and manufacture that we're willing to see. We're willing to remunerate the time of um, not just the labor of, because that's slow labor. It's labor that can and should take time. It's not exertive. Um, it somehow occupies the body in different ways. And so um, I think putting to like contingently revalue these forms of labor next to each other would radically change how we talked about not just you know how much a t-shirt can cost, but also what is beautiful on the body. Um, and what the body should want to wear and not want to wear. Because all this like aesthetic choice is also then tied into, especially late capital, every other choice is, is financialized. All right, well, thank you so much for this. Thank you so much.